I'm here today to remind you that you are magnificent communicators, even if you don't feel like one. How many of us truly feel heard on a daily basis? Really honestly heard? Very few, I think. Kids don't listen, the dogs play dead, the bosses don't listen, the headlines scream, Singaporean workers not engaged at the workplace. So what needs to change? We can. For the last 12 years, I've sat across some incredibly charismatic individuals, princes, politicians, people campaigning for change, people with unassailable educational pedigree. But what I've noticed is those who are persuasive aren't the most articulate. And those who are the most convincing on air aren't necessarily the most successful. So what is it about some people that are able to you know, hold our attention. They speak in a way that makes us all want to lean in. What do they have that we don't? Are good communicators born or made? In my opinion, they're made. I should know. I'm an introverted talk show host. I am happiest when I am at home with a book curled up, but my introversion has never stopped me from turning my mic on and engaging with all of Singapore and taking on some of the finest minds. So it's not about personality, and you can be yourself if you want to be a powerful communicator. And with every interview that I've done, I've learned something to add to my communication toolbox. In fact, when it comes to finding my voice, this idea of adding to a communication repertoire has been one of my greatest challenges. You see, I started as a journalist. And as a journalist, you have to sometimes be adversarial. You have to push people beyond the press release, and sometimes they're naughty, and they want to stray from the questions, and they want to go somewhere else, and you want to bring them back because you're asking for accountability. You want to get to the truth of the matter. So you have to be willing not to be liked. And this can be daunting when there's two people in the room and one person doesn't like you. It's a little bit frightening, but it can also be challenging. And I've learned from every single interview that I have carried out. And I honestly believe that finding my voice has been a unique journey, and it is for every single person. But if you can start to think like a host, I think it's a really powerful exercise that will allow you to step into powerful communication. So let me share with you one of my favorite interviews was with former President S.R. Nathan. 50 stories from my life with his latest book. And like you, I had seen him at the National Day Parades from afar. I had read all his speeches. I had read all his books. But I still didn't know what to expect as I waited for the man to walk in to this interview. And I did want to go to a place that I thought could be possibly contentious. I knew that for six years in the 80s, he had been executive chairman at Singapore Press Holdings. And journalists then had worn black armbands to mourn what they thought was the death of journalistic freedom. A hostile uh, sort of environment for him to walk to. And as I sat there, I thought, I wonder how he's going to treat me as a journalist. You know, there are various interpretations about the role of the journalist. So I sat there waiting, and when he came in, I was struck by how open and candid he was there was no no-go zone with former President S.R. Nathan. We talked about his poverty in childhood. We talked about him sleeping in alleys. We talked about his journey to presidency. We talked about his views on censorship. And you know what struck me? How incredibly present this man was. If you want to have powerful conversations, you need that same sense of presence. You give yourself totally to the person that you're talking to. He made me feel heard, and I will never forget that interview. Now, my biggest challenge is dealing with individuals who clam up, and it happens. It has nothing to do with how articulate you are, how intelligent you are, how humongous your business is. Sometimes people just walk in and go, Whoop. why don't we speak up? It's fear, isn't it? It's fear of being judged. So my goal when I want to engage with someone and have a real meaningful conversation is I hold what I call a field of non-judgment and I move with empathy in conversation. 
So for example, I once interviewed a CEO of an IT company, and she was tremendously successful. And I had sent her the question areas beforehand, so she knew what we were going to talk about. But the moment she stepped into the studio, in the blink of an eye, she said, no, 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 I'm not answering any of these questions. I don't want to answer these questions. And so there I was, seconds counting down to live. I have a guess, but I have no questions. So what am I supposed to do? Luckily, at the back of my mind, I had this woman's CV. So I needed to jump into her mind with empathy and construct questions that I knew she could answer. I knew. How did you accomplish this? How did you do that? How did you start your first business? How did you do that? And slowly, slowly, she thawed. And when she got rolling with that momentum, she was amazing. She was brilliant. But it's all about trust, isn't it? I feel she didn't trust herself. She didn't trust her content, didn't trust that what she had would be enough for me. But I trust all the guests that I have on my show. I have them there for a reason. I've searched them out, I've researched their work, I've read everything they've written, and I know that there is some aspect of their work that I agree with. And so I move with curiosity and when they feel that trust, I feel a lot of people come along in that positive conversation. So trust, I feel, is so important when it comes to building a really powerful communication. And people can sense your intention. So before you start a conversation, ask yourself, how do I really feel about this person? Is there some aspect of their work, of their lives, of their message that I can align myself, myself to? Barack Obama feels that the biggest deficit in this world is an empathy deficit, and I agree with him. I think empathy is a declining social good in this world. Now, the definition of empathy is right there. It's really simple. It's just standing in someone else's shoes and seeing the world through their eyes, which is why when I want to beef up my empathy uh, muscles, I turn to fiction. And I'm not alone. The late Nelson Mandela would often turn to a powerful poem called Invictus when he wanted to exercise mind over matter, when he wanted to be master of his soul. Bless his unconquerable soul. So it was with great sadness that I read that the number of Singaporean students who are opting for literature is declining. There's a big drop. It's 3,000 now. Back in 1992, it was 16,970. And what is the reason for this drop? They say it's hard to get a good grade in literature in Singapore. I think they're more important things than good grades. And I think empathy is so important if we want to overcome the fissures that can arise when people are polarized and they identify with their affiliations, if it's political, if it's economic, if it is religious or ethnic, the only way we can overcome the schism between me and you, I and you that's so different is empathy and this ability to move in terms of perspectives. And I have seen this in some of the most powerful communicators. They constantly are able to fluidly move when it comes to perspectives. So let's experience that move in perspective. Let's feel it, okay? Now in the Renaissance period, painters who wanted to render or translate the three-dimensional world around them onto a painting came up with this idea of the linear perspective. There is a single vanishing point somewhere there, and all lines that are parallel in the real world converge towards that single point. So you see, everything gets smaller the further back they are in space. There's that single vanishing point with many of the Renaissance art. In contrast, when you shift in perspectives, let's look at a Chinese scroll. Now imagine this, this is a fully unrolled scroll. A Chinese scroll was about 40 centimeters in length, and when it was unfurled, it could go up to meters in length. You control the unrolling of the scroll, so you decide how much of the vistas you want to see at any one time. Time and space is compressed in that scroll. There is no one single vanishing point. There are many. You can go over the bridge. You can look at the bridge from under the bridge. You can go around the trees. You are part of the narrative. You're invited in. 
This is a wonderful perspective shifting analogy in terms of the fact that there is no one single vanishing point and when you allow yourself to shift in perspectives, you see so much more. And that is what the most powerful communicators constantly do, fluidly shifting perspectives in their minds. The best communicators are able to do that. The worst communicators that I have met are unable or unwilling to shift those perspectives mentally. Now, there is a woman I know, and this, of course, is a composite. You know, there are many people who are terrible communicators, so this is a composite. And I share this with you so you know what not to do when you want to generate a meaningful conversation. This woman holds rigidly to her sense of perspective. To the detriment of the people around her, they clam up. They shut down, they don't offer their best, they don't offer their opinions or their ideas. You can see them, if you observe, they literally try to create social distance from this person. They're looking towards the exit, literally and metaphorically, doing anything to avoid this woman and the cloud of pestilence that issues from her mouth every time she opens her mouth. Why? Because a significant proportion of her communication relies on a style. That depends on the two C's, criticism and contempt, a significant proportion. We all criticize sometimes, but if 80% of your communication in terms of content is based on criticism, you're likely to alienate rather than connect with people in conversation. Now we all know what criticism is. We know what it feels like. It doesn't feel very nice. Basically, it is a sense that somebody points out our perceived faults or mistakes. And sometimes we think, okay, it's warranted. But if 80% of your communication style is based on criticism, I'm telling you, you're likely to make people want to run for the exits. Contempt is extremely interesting to me. It's different from criticism because it conveys a sense of positioning in communication. When I am contemptuous of the person that I am speaking to, you can see it in the curl of my lip, in the lift of my eyebrow, because what I am communicating is that not only are you wrong, baby, but you are inferior. You are inferior to me. And Dr. John Gottman, who is an eminent researcher in the field of marriage, says criticism and contempt are two of the four significant predictors of divorce. So really something to think about in terms of your communication style. And if you'd like more information, head to the Gottman Institute. I love this quote by Thich Nhat Hanh, who reminds us that when you are aiming for powerful dialogue, what you want to do is ask yourself this question, am I willing to change? Am I willing to move in dialogue? Dialogue, the way I experience it, feels like a dance to me. I'm not leading just because I'm the interviewer. It feels like there is an ebb and a flow, a give and a take, and in true dialogue, both sides come with courage. Because true dialogue means you're willing to surrender some part of yourself. You're willing to change. You're willing to give up some of your cherished assumptions. People can sense that willingness. So ask yourself, am I willing to move in dialogue? Real, meaningful dialogue requires constant reflexivity. But it's so worth it when you feel the energy that comes forward, when people genuinely feel seen and they feel heard by you. So listen and engage and learn and grow. You are a powerful communicator, magnificent. So start thinking like a host and watch the change that can happen one powerful conversation at a time. Thank you.